Hi folks, welcome to today's topic of the treatment of Parkinson's disease. We will learn how to reduce the shaking. Not wasting much time, let's take a look at our usual medical mnemonic. So we're going to use this figure right here to explore and summarize the various pharmacological target mechanism in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Now recall Parkinson's is a degenerative disease that affects the basal ganglia, a structure very crucial for the initiation of movement. In Parkinson's there is an imbalanced activity between dopaminergic neurons and cholinergic activity. In other words, there is less dopamine and there is more acetylcholine. So what I have in this diagram is the periphery, that is the blood. And here we have the blood-brain barrier and of course the central nervous system. So the major goal in Parkinson's disease is to get dopamine into the central nervous system as quick as possible. And the drug that we're going to use is levodopa or L-dopa. This is a pro-drug, meaning it is able to convert into dopamine with the help of the enzyme dopa decarboxylase. First, let's take a look at what happens in the periphery. So L-DOPA right here, which is the drug of choice, can be metabolized into dopamine peripherally. But we do not want this to occur because once dopamines are formed peripherally, then they go to waste and they are not able to cross the blood-brain barrier. And the excessive dopamines in the blood peripherally can also lead to unwanted side effects. So pharmacologically, we can target the DOPA decarboxylase enzyme and prevent the metabolism of L-DOPA into dopamine. We can use the drug Carbidopa so that there is gonna be more of the L-DOPA peripherally being less degraded and these L-DOPA can effectively and efficiently cross the blood-brain barrier and move into the central nervous system. Another thing to also know peripherally is that L-DOPA can be metabolized into 3-O-methyl-DOPA. Substances when elevated are partial agonists with L-DOPA. In other words, they compete even with certain receptors with L-DOPA. So when these substances right here are high, that is not going to effectively make the L-DOPA cross into the central nervous system. So we've got to block this enzyme that metabolizes L-DOPA, and that enzyme is called catechol o methyltransferase. Once this enzyme is blocked by entacapone or tolcapone, this agent, then we're going to make less of the 3 o methyl dopa and that's going to help reduce the peripheral degradation or metabolism of L-DOPA. So as you can see, we must make every effort to prevent metabolism of L-DOPA peripherally, but we must try to rather get L-DOPA across the membrane into the central nervous system. So now in the central nervous system, L-DOPA is now going to be metabolized into dopamine right here. But this is something that we really need. Okay, in contrast to the periphery, you saw that carbidopa had to block dopa decarboxylase because we do not want the dopamine peripherally. But in the central nervous system, we do want the dopamines over there. And so we want the dopa decarboxylase here to be rather active so that that can metabolize L-DOPA into dopamines. When dopamine is high in the central nervous system, it will certainly bind to receptors, dopamine receptors, and of course help the patient resolve some of their symptoms. So another area we can look at is preventing dopamines from being degraded in the central nervous system. The enzyme monoamine oxidase type B degrades dopamine into inactive substances such as dopac. So we can also make an effort to prevent this because we want the dopamines to stay in the central nervous system. So we can use the drug Seligelin to target this enzyme and prevent this enzyme from degrading dopamine. Seligelin can be metabolized into amphetamine. So patients that are on Seligelin may complain of sleep inconsistencies or some agitations is possible. So we can use Seligelin, of course, also to help retain dopamine in the central nervous system. Now in the central nervous system, we have the dopamine receptors. 
And so we can also target these receptors with dopamine receptor agonist. And here I want to emphasize on pramipexol and ropinerol because these drugs are able to moderately stimulate these receptors. Hence, they have less side effects compared to drugs such as bromocryptine and pergolite that will effectively or sort of stimulate these receptors too much to the extent that there's going to be side effects. So these agents are more preferred. I want to talk about something called on and off effect. So on off effect occurs in Parkinson's disease and we call this fluctuations. What does that mean? When you give the patient L-DOPA, what happens is that the patient is turned on and their symptoms improve. But when the dosage weans off or when the level of dopamine is cleared, then the patient is turned off. So there isn't enough, uh, say, steady dose of the dopamine in the central nervous system to keep the patient on all the time. Sometimes it, the dosage comes down. And so what we do is we can combine certain agents so that we can maintain a steady state of dopamine levels in the central nervous system. Therefore, we can combine, say, carbidopa and entercopone with, say, L-dopa. Or we can add selegiline to the drugs and this can help improve the on-off effect. Now, I also want to say that we can also target the acetylcholine in the central nervous system. But when we target that or when we inhibit that part, it only serves to reduce the tremor and the rigidity. It doesn't have much effect on the bradykinesia that we have in Parkinson's disease. All right, so blocking or slowing down the metabolism of L-DOPA into 3-O-methyl-DOPA is also a good thing and an advantage for the Parkinson's disease patient because these substances, again, when they are in excess in the central nervous system, they are partial agonists and will compete for receptors with L-DOPA. So that's a great thing. And we can use the COMT inhibitors. And here specifically, tolcopone is a drug that is able to penetrate the blood-brain barrier and put some breaks on this reaction that is going to lead to less formation of 3-O-methyl-DOPA and that is going to increase the L-DOPA subsequently and of course increasing dopamine levels in the central nervous system. So some few words about dopamine. When dopamine is in excess and stimulates the dopamine receptors excessively that can lead to a couple of side effects one of them being dyskinesias, movement disorders. One of them can also be the fact that dopamine is a pleasurable substance. So excessive dopamine can lead to addiction and dopamine in excess can lead to some psychotic features as well as dopamine being able to trigger a certain zone or the chemo receptors. So dopamine can lead to vomiting. When dopamine is blocked, they can also lead to a hypothermic state because dopamine regulates temperature. And finally, dopamine in excess or when they stimulate the receptors excessively, can also lead to weight loss. So anticholinergic agents are also used in the management of Parkinson's disease, but to be precise, they are only useful for the tremor and rigidity, otherwise has no effect on the bradykinesia. In Parkinson's disease, we recall that there is an imbalance between the dopaminergic neurons and the cholinergic activity. So what I'm demonstrating here is the indirect pathway in which the cholinergic activity seems to be high and dopamines are rather low. So we have a patient with Parkinson's disease who lacks dopamine. So this means that dopamine would not be able to inhibit the indirect pathway through the D2 receptors. So the indirect pathway normally would have dopamine using the D2 receptors to suppress this indirect pathway. And cholinergic activity is done to increase the indirect pathway. So we have a situation where the dopamine is down because there is a disease, there is a degenerative disease. And so dopamine is not able to stimulate these D2 receptors and inhibit this indirect pathway. Better still, cholinergic activity is able to stimulate these muscarinic receptors, M3, and is able to favor the indirect pathway by activating the subthalamic area. When the subthalamic area is activated, it is able to put some breaks or inhibition on the thalamic area, which will be in favor of the indirect pathway. So in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, we can target this cholinergic activity by blocking these receptors so that we prevent excessive 
inhibition from the subthalamic area that moves into the thalamic area because the thalamic area is where you know it helps with the movement the initiation of the movement the motor nuclei here in the thalamic area is projected to the motor cortex and helps with the initiation of movement but if the subthalamic area is putting some inhibition on the thalamic zone then that's going to lead to poor movement tremor and other things so uh, the treatment option can of course be using bench stroping for example to target these m3 receptors and block them so that it can help with the tremor and the rigidity well i guess you're thinking what is amantadine doing here isn't that used for treating viruses well, you may be right, but amantadine is also able to block muscarinic receptors and increase dopamine release. This means that they are also used for the tremors and the rigidity. Antipsychotic agents may also be used if patients with Parkinson's are exhibiting any psychotic features or any personality issues, as well as mood changes. The neurodegenerative nature of Parkinson's disease leads to a cognitive decline and speech impairment. Patients would benefit through speech therapy that would help them to improve aspects of their speech such as articulation techniques the frequency of the speech facial expressions when interacting to help patients communicate adequately other treatment modalities may include pallidotomy and telemotomy to properly understand this i would encourage you to check out my other video on parkinson's disease where i have described the various pathways of the basal ganglia so here we will just describe the abstract so i have the direct pathway here and we have the indirect pathway there normally the direct pathway is driven by dopamine, which is produced from the substantia nigra, and dopamine will activate D1 receptors. These D1 receptors are able to stimulate something called disinhibition phenomenon, where these neurons are able to inhibit another group of neurons in the globus pallidus internal segment, and that one will eventually excite the thalamus, so that the excitement of the motor nuclei in the thalamus can be relayed to the motor cortex and the movement can be initiated so this is the direct pathway so in contrast the indirect pathway also has these neurons that gets inhibited and those neurons would also inhibit a second population of neurons in the globus pallidus external segment these GABA neurons would eventually excite the subthalamus in fact the cholinergic activity of the indirect pathway is quite high and that is how it exhibits its inhibitory effect on the motor nuclei of the thalamus. So the indirect pathway inhibits the direct pathway. It does that by preventing these GABA neurons here in the direct pathway from activating the thalamus. So that in our treatment modality, we can use pallidotomy to destroy those nucleuses or neurons in the globus pallidus internal segment and by doing so, the indirect pathway would not be able to use these GABA neurons to inhibit the thalamus. Moreover, this can also be done by removing or destroying certain nucleus in the thalamus. It's similar in that aspect. So electrical stimulation of deeper parts of the brain, such as the thalamus and the subthalamus, can also be used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Thank you, and I hope this was useful. If you enjoyed it, then hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Bye.